All right, so let's start with a scenario. Let's say that you have a record. So we're looking, we're in service now, and I decide to create the record, right? Or maybe I change the short description on the record. So once you hit that save button or that update button or whatever it may be, the screen refreshes, right? And so we don't kind of know what's going on there, but something happens. We can, we know something happens. We don't know what it is. And then the record reappears. And so now as kind of depicted on the screen, the record looks a little bit different than what you had originally submitted or saved, right? So maybe now the assignment group is filled in. And so you want to know really what happened here. You need to know, and it's really best for your own self and career growth across this technology, to know what else is going on. What are some of the scripts and engines that are happening behind the scenes? So my name is Alan Andreas. Welcome to Alan Ovation. And we're gonna talk about execution order for scripts and engines today. So this is what we mean when we're talking through this video here. What do we mean by scripts and engines? It's server-side scripts and engines that are called upon in relation uh, to a database operation. And so examples of that are things like business rules and the scripts within, assignment rules, workflows, data policies, flows, and notifications. And notice workflows and flows are two different things. One is workflow legacy and one is flows, which is in flow designer. So that's what we mean by that. So what was this about database operations? Because again, we're maybe talking at too high of a level people may not know. What is a database operation? Well, a database operation, also known as glide events, these are good terminology behind the scenes, things that you want to get kind of familiar with, glide events, such as insert, update, and delete, are fired into the glide engine, which is a data drive. And we'll get into more of this in a minute, but we're already we're now talking about glide events. We're talking about a glide engine, and this causes a glide transaction to execute. So a few examples of how a database operation can be triggered, and again, we're talking about insert, update, and delete. This can be triggered through things like a user clicking the submit button causes an insert event to fire into the glide engine because you're submitting the record. You're not saving it, you're submitting it. You're thus inserting it, causing that glide event into fire into that glide engine. It's a glide transaction is now going to kick off, right? Another scenario is a user clicks the update button. Well, now an update event fires into the glide engine. A user clicks the delete button. A delete event fires into the glide engine. Or maybe there's a script containing a glide record object and you've used the insert, update, or delete method within the script that's related to that. For example, here we've initialized a new record for the incident table, and now we've inserted it. This would cause an insert transaction, a glide transaction to, or a glide event of insert to cause a glide transaction to kick off, right? Or for incident, we've instantiated a glide record object. We are getting the sys ID, so we know a specific record we want to pull into the script, and now we're going to actually delete it. So now we do a delete, which will be a delete event as a transaction into the Glide engine. So a Glide transaction high level overview is really consists of one Glide event is one Glide transaction. It's a one for one. An insert, delete, update is one insert, update, delete transaction that's gonna do some stuff on the platform. And so for example here, we have a Glide up event here as update, which is gonna kick off this transaction. It begins, then there's a data transformation and security portion to this that's going to happen before. So we're talking about before the record is stored on the database. When the data lands on the database and it's become stored, there's post-processing that takes effect. And certain things run in the before side of things, which we're going to get to, and certain things run in the post-processing the after. So you have to strategically be aware of this on the platform when you're dealing with records and updates because there's certain things that happen before and certain things that happen after. And then after that, the Glide transaction ends and you'll see it goes from top to bottom down. As of this point where we are in the journey of a transaction, it's now begun. The Glide journey, Glide transaction journey has begun. So now we're gonna step into the data transformation and security section and kind of walk through that. There's a before business rules will kick off. 
So in your business rules on the platform, you can check before or you can you know, choose when, before or after, uh, you know, on update, on insert, those types of things. So you can choose before and set the order on it. If it's less than 1,000, those business rules are all going to go off. For that table, for that record, again, pretending we're doing an, an incident record, we've inserted it onto the table. This is, an, uh, this is an update, right? An update scenario before business rules less than 1000 and then these are all of the engines that are actually going to go off before it even lands again into the database you have an approval engine that's going to kick off asking for approvals and things uh data policies are going to go off the role engine data lookup engine the workflow engine which is not the flow designer flow engine this is the legacy workflow engine default style these flows, workflows rather, also go off. And then after that, before business rules of an order greater than or equal to 1000, then fire off. So a lot of stuff happens. And I know the blip of a second when we do something on the platform, a little bit of time, a couple milliseconds go by and then the record reappears back on the screen. A lot of stuff happens. <laughs> and this is just the before part of it, right? So now where are we in the transaction? Now the data has been stored. So now it's been stored and now we're into post-processing. But before we get to that, let's do an important call out here. Once the data is stored, the following processes will access this version of the data. So remember, I might have an incident record and I've set the short description to be whatever it might be. It didn't have any assignment group on it. Now it's going in, all the before things kick off. Now my short description might have changed to something else if one of these before business rules or one of these engines changed it for whatever reason. And maybe now the assignment rule engine kicks off. It's been assigned to the service desk team now at this point. Anything in post-processing is going to access the data as it stands now that it's been on the database. It's not going to be what I put in originally. Now it's going to be whatever it got to, whatever it landed on the database. Now everything else is going to react to that, right? So that's where certain behaviors can change depending on some of these things you have configured, which is why it's good to know the execution order. So an example, a user saves an incident record with a short description of laptop screen is cracked. A before business rule was configured for some reason to set all incident short descriptions to test one, two, three. This means that any scripts and engines that fire after this above business rule will only see the current short description as test one, two, three. It's not even gonna see anything about laptop screen anymore. It's not laptop screen cracked, it's gone. So now we're into post-processing. So similar to before, the after business rules of an order less than 1000 are gonna go off. Then these after engines, you're going to notice here that this is where workflow engine, again, legacy workflow engine, deferred set workflows fire off, as well as this is when flow designer flows kick off. This is why you can set a trigger on it to say on record created, then do this flow. Well, the system won't count it as created until it actually lands on the database and becomes created and it posts. So this is why it's post-processing. Now triggered flow designer flows are gonna go off. Then the next thing is email notifications. So if there was any email notifications, whether that was through event driven or directly in the notification itself where you have a condition builder on it and saying, if the assigned to is not empty, then send this notification, right? Maybe to telling the team or a person that they've been assigned an incident, these are going to go off. And then again, as similar before, uh, after business rules with an order greater than or equal to 1000 are going to go off. This is again, why it's important to know this. Look at all of these things. We're at like 20 engines, a plethora of different business rules, email notifications. It's good to know when these things might go down when you're actually, and all this was from just updating a record. That was it. And all this stuff happened. So now where are we? Well, now post-processing is done. And now the glide transaction has completed. You know, you may say, well, what about async business rules, asynchronous business rules? When, when do those go off? Well, unlike after business rules, asynchronous business rules execute on a different processing thread. 
So before that glide transaction, that whole package that we just walked through, that was one thread, one execution, one transaction. A sync business rules fire and execute on a completely different processing thread. And the reason for that is that this allows the current transaction to complete. Remember that glide transaction, that one whole thing needs to complete or it'll just freeze the user screen. So if async rules were also in the same transaction vein while this was all going on, that user screen's locked up until all this stuff is done. That's why it's called asynchronous, asynchronously happening you behind the scenes. It doesn't need to freeze up the user's uh, screen. You wanna use async instead of after when the logic can be executed in near real time, it doesn't need to be literally in real time, just near, you know, within a few seconds or so, as opposed to real time. So that's when you use async. So examples of when to use it is when you're invoking web services through like the REST API, when a parent record is closed and you're gonna close a bunch of children records, do you really need to freeze up the screen when the parent record's being updated or closed? to have the user wait for all the child records to close? No, that could be done kind of behind the scenes. Send notifications using events. So you don't need to fire the event to trigger the notification in any real business rule. If I mean, can it, can it wait a few seconds to go out? Does it have to go right then or can it wait? And then firing script actions. So script actions are triggered through events. And then service level agreement calculations. A lot of people don't know this, but SLA calculations happen asynchronous, asynchronously as well, not in the glide transaction that just, that just took place. So the key takeaways here for this whole entire thing is that you've now gained awareness about the execution order of scripts and engines. You've become familiar with glide events, glide transactions, and the glide engine. And you've learned the importance of executing certain processes asynchronously. And so that's where, you know, we really try to get to understanding the platform from a holistic sense. This is going to level your game up. It's gonna give you more perspective. It's gonna help you understand when things are going on. This is why it's important to know, okay, I know it was a flow kept kicking off. Well, flows and flow designer happen after the record's been saved to the database. So it's not any of these before rules doing this kind of thing. It's stuff after, right? You'll start to learn some of that. So once again, my name is Alan Andreas, host of Alan Ovation, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe to the channel, like it, and share it with others. And until next time, take care.